Joshua 1, verse 1, if you're ready, say, preach, preacher. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right, to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. God, help. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give someone a high five. Have a seat. Let's talk about success. At the beginning of COVID, the pandemic, I was in a Zoom call with a lot of national leaders. And there were hundreds of these leaders. And I was one of the low on the totem pole people. And it was a Zoom call. Of course, I was muted, but many of the Higher profile leaders were speaking. There were generals from the military and senators and Congress people, the CEOs of nonprofit organizations. And as we got sort of toward the end of this call, there was this sentiment that was given by more than one of the leaders, which was this. And I'm going to ask for a ladder to be brought out because it, it really sort of gave me a, th this image. These guys were talking, they said, you know, I've achieved a lot in my career, I've done a lot in my life, there's been a lot that when people look at me, they esteem me very highly, but they described it like this, they said, it feels though like I have climbed to the top of the ladder, and now that I've reached the top of this ladder, I find myself wondering, did I put the ladder on the wrong wall? Did I put the ladder on the wrong wall? I've made my way up, and when people look at me, they, they're impressed when they see my net worth, when they see the influence that I have, when they see that I speak and people move, that they've been very impressed with what seems like success, but I cannot find myself but wondering, am I truly successful? Because yes, I'm at the top of the ladder, but is the ladder on the wrong wall? We believers that follow Jesus and, and read the Bible, we've got an interesting relationship with a word like success. We, we sort of don't know what to do because on one hand, success is something that everybody in all of culture wants. Everybody wants to be successful. If I were to say, who wants to be a loser, no one's going to raise their hand. And yet, we find an interesting tension because if you read the Bible, it says things like be humble. It says to not be arrogant. You should treat arrogance like a disease. You should treat pride like cancer. It says you should be meek. The meek will inherit the earth. Well, how do you reconcile being meek and humble and, and lowly and gentle with a desire to be successful? And yet we read in the scripture in this book of Joshua and we find in the Bible a truth that I need you to understand. And, and I want you to understand this from the context of the glory of God and the purposes of God and the fullness of, of all that God does. But we find an interesting truth because Really, all I'm going to say today is this, God wants you to be successful. Like, like I realize only like two of you said amen because you, it almost feels sacrilegious to say that, but God wants you to succeed. That's what he tells Joshua right here. He says, I want you to be strong and courageous so that, and he, and he says, so that then you will be prosperous and successful. So the question is, how do we achieve success? How do we put the ladder on the right wall? How do we achieve something like that? I want to kind of break that down really just with two thoughts today. The first one is this. Joshua, all the Joshua's in this room, all the Joshuinas, I don't know what the female version of Joshua would be. But number one, if you're going to be successful, number one, if you're taking notes, get clear about your assignment. Get clear about your assignment. The first paragraph of Joshua chapter one 
It says, after the death of Moses, God appears to Joshua and he tells him, this is your assignment. Before we move into that, though, I want to make clear the shoes that he's stepping into. Now, I don't want to make more of this moment. I would have said this even if Coach Napier didn't bring the team today. Uh, but I, I just want you to appreciate the nature of the stress that Joshua surely felt as he's happening to walk in the shadow of a leader that came before him, which was the greatest leader that maybe the world had ever known. And what was his name? Moses. This was Moses. This is the Moses that through Moses, God walked into the courts of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. It was through Moses that these plagues were brought to pass. It was th through Moses that, that Moses took his rod and stuck it into the water and the water turns into dry ground and the children of Israel walked through and the horse and the rider were drowned in the sea. It was through Moses that God delivered the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone as he went up. It was through Moses that he struck a rock and water came. It was through Moses that he fed them with manna in the wilderness. It was through Moses that every great thing that the people of God could imagine had come to pass. The very words of God were delivered through the hands and mouth of Moses. Can you appreciate the pressure you would feel when, when God says, Joshua, Moses is dead, to which if I'm Joshua, I would say, yeah, I was at the funeral. I, I know a little bit about what this is like because when I took over as the pastor of our church, it was just a, a little while after Steve Spurrier, who had been the coach of the Gators, who, was the, the, who had, had been the greatest Gator coach there had ever been, and he had moved on, and another coach came in whose name was Ron Zook, and, and there was some really hard times in Gator football. And when I became, when I got voted in as pastor, I got voted in by a large margin, but there were several people that didn't, and there was a little sentiment of some people that said, oh, bless your heart, you're Ron Zook. What a bummer to have to follow in the, in the footsteps of, of a Steve Spurrier. What a, what a bummer to have to follow in the footsteps of of a Moses, but God tells Moses, and I want to say to all of you that are here today, something that Joshua needed to remember, which was, yes, God was working through Moses, but it was God who was working through Moses. And when the people of God pass on, and when one generation folds into another generation, I need all of you guys to understand that the purposes of God are not contingent on one man or one woman. God will use anybody that wants to be used by him. God delights in being used, and he says, do not be afraid. The reason he says it three times in nine verses, do not be afraid, be strong and courageous, be not be afraid, I will be with you, is because clearly Joshua was going to have a little complex, a little inferiority complex. Do I have what it takes? And today, I want to let you know, if you are willing to go in God's direction, I, can, I think I can tell you with great certainty, you can have what it takes. Because God wants you to succeed. He says in verse 3, I'm going to give you this land. And he gives them these boundaries. He says, you're going to have from the, the Euphrates to the, to the sea. You're going to have the land of the Hittites. And he gives them his boundaries. I want to be clear that you can't do anything, but you can do anything that God has called you to do. In fact, you should do everything that God has called you to do. Number one, if you're going to be successful, get clear about your assignment. Joshua, I'm not giving you the land of India. I'm not giving you the land of Iran. I'm not going to give you South America. But I'm giving you the promised land. And just to be clear, if anyone's ever struggled with these parts of Old Testament scripture of, of them going in, God had always announced that there's a day of judgment that's coming. And there, was, there were evil nations that were very unjust, unlike other nations even in the world. Israel was anointed by God to go in and take that land in so much as they only did what God was calling them to do. Be clear about your assignments. Your assignments, they were God's means of executing judgment on, against injustice. God is merciful, but God is just. And there is a day of judgment. And he says, I want you to get clear about your assignment. And he gives them his mission. Your mission, Joshua, is to lead the people to the promised land. I love how it says it in Habakkuk chapter 2. It says, write the vision, make it clear. Write the vision and make it clear. There's a book that I read recently called True Venture. Any of you that are into leadership, any of you that are into vision, it's a book called True Venture. And the idea behind this book was that God has a venture for you, that God's got a, a vision for you. God's got a mission. I don't care if you use the word vision, mission, objective, purpose. Get clear about your assignment. And here's how, this is really the application of this first point. I want you to answer this question. 
What does wildly successful look like in your life? What does wildly successful look like in your career, in your family, at your job? If you're a high school senior this year, what does wildly successful, when you pull back the curtain, and the reason I'm quoting Habakkuk 2 is because I want you to go and do something with this. I dare you to write this down. He says, write it down in a way that the one who hears it can run with it. Write down, what is your vision? What is your mission? What is your purpose? What is your assignment of what you are supposed to do? I, I love Sam Walton, the guy that, that really did Walmart, that started Walmart. His, his assignment back in the day was very clear when he was still alive. Walmart was created to bring high quality products at the lowest prices possible so that the common American could go buy high quality products at the lowest price possible. It was a vision you could write down and someone could run with it. The best products at the lowest price for the common human. It was a compelling vision that you could run. What is your assignment? This means that your job, if you are a secretary, if you're a teacher, if you're a fireman, if you are a linebacker, if you are whatever position you play in whatever organization you are, what is you get clear about your Assignment, number one, if you're going to be successful, you need to know what your assignment is. You need to know what your promised land is. Number two, if you're going to be successful, number two, second paragraph, you have to build follow-through mechanisms. Build follow-through mechanisms. One of the great coaches of all time is a guy named John Wooden, who was the coach of the UCLA Bruins as a basketball coach. And he really is uh, somewhat unique in what he's done. Just to give you a little, little biography of his, they asked him, what is your secret? How did you do it? And just to give you a little refresher, any of you that are younger and don't know much about him, he won 10 national championships, which is a record. He got seven in a row, which is a record. They won 88 consecutive games, which is a record. They had 38 straight tournament playoff wins, which is a record. They had four perfect seasons, a record, with only one losing year in his 41 years of coaching. And they asked him, how did you do that? To which he said... We got clear about what we were going to do, and then we built good habits. That's it. We took the right wall, and we attached the ladder of our habits to that wall. We attached our culture to where we were trying to go. We attached these habits to where we were trying to go. And when we did that, that is when it came. He said this, I focused on the process over the prize. I never fixated on winning. In fact, I didn't even mention it to my players. Winning is the byproduct of culture. And culture is the byproduct of habits. I might even say culture tends to be what you teach, what you tolerate, and where you meditate. You know a culture by what is taught, by, by what is tolerated, and where someone's meditations go. This is what he said. Wooden said, others may have more ability than you. They may be larger than you. They may be faster than you. They may be quicker than you. But no one should be your superior with team spirit, loyalty, enthusiasm, cooperation, determination, industriousness, fight, and character. Acquire and keep these traits and success will follow, which is the result of habits. So if number one is get clear about your assignment, be, be clear about where you're placing this ladder, number two is you've got, you've got to build follow-through mechanisms. And there's been a, a, a litany of books that have been written in the last 10 years on habits. My favorite is Atomic Habits. And the idea behind a lot of the brain science that's come out in these recent times has been that willpower is highly overrated. If you're hoping that you're going to get a culture, if you're hoping that you're going to get racist culture undone by willpower, it's not going to happen. Racism gets, over, gets undone by systemic addressing of habitual patterns that must be undone. That's how, that's how you overcome that. It, it can't simply be, I, I got to try really hard. If you're trying to lose weight, if one of your goals is, I'm trying to lose weight, it's not going to be enough. Here, let me say it again. Willpower is overrated. The brain science is you only have a certain amount of willpower per day. And when you've used up all your willpower, it's all used up. Okay? So... If you love Haagen-Dazs ice cream, let's say you love 
peanut butter, chocolate, haagen ice cream. And if you're trying to lose weight, and if there is a buy one, get one free sale going on at Publix, that might not be a sign from God. And when you're sitting in your bed at 10 o'clock at night and your spouse has fallen asleep or your roommate's fallen asleep and, and all of a sudden you hear something in the kitchen coming from the freezer saying, my precious. <laughs> in that moment, you need not assume that that's a sign from God that he's calling you to that. What, what the brain scientists tell us is if you've got a problem with haagen at 10 o'clock at night, you've only got one option. You don't buy it in the first place. If you're eating haagen it's on a special day when there are bodyguards all around you and everyone's there to tell you and you're eating it while you're on the scale. That's the only time you do it. You would already know. The same thing goes with, with organizational traits. The same thing goes in your life. You've got to build, you, you build follow-through mechanisms to get you to do what you already want to do. If you already want to read your Bible every day, what I'm telling you is you've got to find follow-through mechanisms. For example, today is August 14th. Today, I, I'm a big proponent of if you want success in business or leadership, I'll tell you one thing you should do. Read the book of Proverbs every single day. 31 days in a usual month. There's 31 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. Sometimes you'll say, I don't even know what to read in the Bible. Well, today's the 14th of August, so guess what proverb you read? Proverbs 14. It becomes like a trigger. You already know what's going to happen. There's a trigger that you, you need system, watch, follow through mechanisms that get you to do what you always wanted to do anyway. Now, that's what God tells him here. He says, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey, verse 7, everything I've told you to do. Don't turn left or right, that you may be successful for wherever you go. Now, let me just get this clear. God is telling Joshua, if you will do the plan, if you will work the plan, forget about just trying to get a victory. Forget, forget about a word like success. Success, wouldn't would say, success is a byproduct of habits, which are a byproduct of having the right kind of a culture. Your culture becomes the sum of the habits that you've created, which is why you've got to come up with systems in place that get you. So you've, you've got to work this into you. So let me just take this and apply this to God's word. He says, keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. So he uses the word meditate. Everyone say meditate. Now this freaks everybody out. Everyone's thinking like sit down in a lotus position and make a humming sound. Meditation, it means the thing that your mind is on. He says, I want you to meditate. If you will meditate on my word day and night, you will be successful. Now I'm going to give everyone in here a promise. If you will meditate on God's word day and night, you will be successful. To which you might say, there's no way I can meditate on God's word day and night. To which I would say, yes, you can. To which you would say, I'm not sure I can. What I'm saying is if you will attach the ladder of your life with the habits of your life and put them on the right wall, something's going to happen. So what do I have in my phone here? What do I have in my hand here? <laughs> a hand. I'm a phone. Because when people wake up in the morning, what's usually the first thing they do? So, so I will talk to people, and, and I will watch a guy. And I'm like, whoa, I was at the gym the other day, and, and, and someone's like, oh, yeah, it's the, it's, it's the latest TikTok dance. I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I'm about six hours in. Like, I'm, I'm pretty good. Like, well, well, when do you do that? I do it in the morning, and I do it at night, and I practice. And, and all the, like, there are people that literally, they are meditating on TikTok in the morning, and they're meditating on TikTok at night. They're meditating on Instagram in the morning, and they're meditating on Instagram at night. They're meditating on Facebook in the morning, and at lunch, and at night. There are some of you, you get in line at Moe's, and you are on your phone waiting to get interrupted when someone says, welcome to Moe's. Because you've been meditating. Meditate just means where you place your mind. Your mind gets placed. So all I'm trying to tell you is this. We already know how to meditate because we do it with our phones all the time. Now let me ask you a very compelling question. Let me just ask you two questions in a row. What is your assignment? I really would be interested. In fact, anyone in our church, if you want to write your assignment down, send it to your pastor. I will pray over. You email me. I will pray over your assignment. Number two. Question number two. If I looked at your screen time, if I looked at the screen time of your phone, would I be able to logically conclude what your assignment is by the way you spend your time on this phone? Because the phone don't lie. The meditation don't lie. Your life is going to follow your meditation. I'm going to say it again. Your life is going to follow your meditation. 
Your culture is going to follow your meditation. So you may say, I've got a mission to do X and Y and Z. I'm going to go to the promised land. But if the promised land is not in your meditation in the morning and in the afternoon and in the evening, if the, let me put it in 21st century lingo. If the promised land does not make it on your phone, let me say it differently. Matt and Tracy are here. They've got a daughter whose name is Aletheia. She's precious, highly intelligent, amazing, and beautiful, okay? We were all at the beach. A bunch of us went to the beach. We were at the beach, and... Uh, Alethea starts talking to me. She says, hola, Pastor Mike. I'm like, well, hello there. She says, hola, como estas? I'm like, well, I'm, estoy bien. Como estas? She says, estoy muy bien. Estoy estudiando español. I'm studying Spanish. I'm like, whoa, I had this conversation with her. She's like, I can now speak 7,264 words in Spanish. And she's having full conversations with me. And we're sitting here doing this, and it was amazing. It was, we, we built this. We made, someone made like a turtle. She says, we'll call this La Isla de Tortuga. It was amazing. Well, my kids, now I've got eight children, okay? Eight kids, all right? Fruitful wife, I sneeze, she gets pregnant. Eight kids. My wife, <laughs> my wife's Puerto Rican. I got my Puerto... My kids come back from this trip to the beach as soon as we get back to Gainesville. Guess what my kids wanted? They wanted her secret. No, they didn't want ice cream. They wanted her secret because guess how Alethea is speaking so much Spanish? She downloaded an app. It's called Duolingo. You got Duolingo, you better give me commission for this right now. That's all I got to say. So my kids are like, Alethea is being raised by two gringo parents. And she's speaking all this Spanish. And here we are raised by, uh, we are Boricua, we're Puerto Ricans. And we're not speaking Spanish like her. Dad, this is your fault. I'm like, download Duolingo right now. And sure enough, there's this thing. Every time you get a question right, it goes ding, ding. And we have all these devices in our house. And I love coming home. And when I come home, I'll hear ding, ding, ding. And it's like music to my ears because I know that one of my kids is going to walk up and start speaking to me. And here's my point. Your, your life is going to follow your meditation. John Wooden would say, you know, don't focus on success. That's the byproduct. Focus on culture, which is the result of habits. Build the habits. I dare you to use your phone to do what you already do. Just do it on purpose. If some of you would go ahead and take your phone and attach it to the right ladder on the right wall, your life would change. I mean, let me say it differently. The way that he puts it to, to Joshua, he says, I, I want this word. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. This is verse 8, on your lips. I can't make myself meditate all the time. I can make myself talk. You need to use your mouth to help you meditate. And you need your, you need your meditation attached to your assignments. You need to use the resources that God has given you. People, again, you, do, you already do this. I'm not telling you something you don't do. I'm driving down the street, and I pulled over to the car next to some of you, and I'm trying to get your attention. Hey, it's Pastor Mike. And I've seen some of you on your phones playing games at the red light or doing whatever you're doing, you know. And I've also watched some of you, I love to watch some of you like singing songs, you know. And then I say, hey, roll your window down. You're like, oh, let me change the channel real fast. You know, you change. <laughs> now, here's the catch. I listen to mostly Christian music, not because Christian music is better than non-Christian music. The reason I listen to mostly Christian music is because music is meditation. You don't believe me? Go into Walmart and walk around and the music's playing and little girls walk around saying, let it go, let it go. Like, you can't help it. You hear songs, your mouth starts to meditate with the music. I don't listen to Christian music because I think it's so hot. A lot of it's not, okay? I listen to it because I already know God has made a promise. If I will attach my mouth to lead my meditation... And I will attach that to my purpose and to my objective. I'm going to create habits that will create a culture that when someone, because let me just break down the Bible to you guys. How do you go through the world we live in right now, rest your head at night and sleep when everyone else is going crazy? Because this book has words that nothing else does. How do you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and you can fear no evil? Because this book tells you how to do that. What do you do when your teenager says, I feel suicidal, I don't know what I'm going to do, and you're about, everyone else is freaking out? This, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How do you handle it when you don't know which way to go in your career and you've got decisions to make and moves to make and you don't know what to do? I'm just promising you this book is gold after gold after silver. After, this book has the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. 
That's why I listen to Christian music, because I find myself, the other day I was singing a song, I'm like, why am I singing this? I don't even like this song. You ever done that? Because you can't help it. Music makes you meditate. What he, Joshua gave us thousands of years ago, God gave us thousands of years ago, what brain scientists are telling us now. If you could control your mouth, and you could control your meditation, then you will change your culture, and that will change your success levels. But stop just saying, I want to be a success. Go start building habits. Number one, be clear about your assignment. Number two, build, follow, through mechanisms. And then how does this end? It just ends. I'm I'm just going to end it like this. My final point, I just want you to believe. Be strong and courageous, he says to Joshua. Be careful to do these things. But then he says it again in verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. I want to say to some of you firemen out there, be strong policemen. Be strong coaches. Be strong school teachers. Be strong administrators. Be strong Managers, be strong. CEOs, entrepreneurs, be strong and courageous. But Mike, it feels like it's too big. Yeah, Joshua gets it. He's stepping in the shoes of of Moses. He gets it. But there's something in us that has to realize you don't get stronger by lifting the same weights. You get stronger by lifting more weights. Some of you that are playing it safe, I'm calling you to step out and to believe because if you were doing it by yourself, you'd have reason to fear. But he says, he does not say, Joshua, do not be afraid because you've obeyed my word. He says, do not be afraid because I am with you. I'm going to say it again. I am with you. I just want to say to some of all the leaders out there, all the parents out there, all the grandparents, all the students, live like God is. Is with you. Yeah, I, there's a crucial conversation I need to have, but I'm really afraid of what they're going to say. Have the conversation like God is with you. Have patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, humility, but be bold and courageous because God is with you. Believe. God is going to call us to do things that are bigger than us. God is going to call us to fight giants that are bigger than us. God is going to, if God has given you assignments that are from him, they should scare you. And you should say yes anyway. I don't want you making your boldness levels be based on your current levels of ability. I want it to be based on the God that lives inside of you. And Joshua is promised by him success. God, I'm going to say it again once, I'm going to say it again, you to succeed. He wants you to succeed his way, on his wall, with his habits. you got to get clear about your assignment. you got to build follow-through mechanisms that that, that work. They just work. You do it day after day after day after day, and that's going to become a habit. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to believe. Moses, my servant, is dead. If I just stop now, it's just a TED Talk. Let me preach the gospel to you. Moses is dead. Joshua. Moses represents the law. The law was given through Moses. But Moses had to die before he could go into the... Moses could not bring the the people into the promised land. I got to tell you, this book is full of wonderful principles and wisdom that that you need. And by all means, they work whether you believe in Jesus or not. And maybe you're from another faith or religion. And we're just so honored that you'd even be with us and all of that. But I want to... Let me just give you what's called the good news of Jesus Christ. Moses represents the law that could only take him to a certain point because at some point it had to, to get to the promised land. It was going to take Joshua. It was going to take Joshua, who would also be called Yeshua, which was the Old Testament version of the New Testament name, Jesus. Joshua can only take you so far because Joshua, uh, Moses can only go so far because they're going to need a Joshua to come and to take it from Moses. Moses represents the law, and the law is like when I was out in the lobby, someone said, hey, Pastor Mike, something's on your face. So I went into the bathroom, and I cleaned my face. But let me tell you what I did not do. I did not walk in the bathroom and pick up the mirror to clean off my face because the mirror cannot clean me it can only show me that I need to be cleaned. The law of God is perfect. It's a perfect mirror. It can, it can instruct you where to set your habits and where to put your ladder, but at the end of the day, the law was never enough to save us. 
We need more than a Moses. We need a Joshua. We need more than a law. We need a grace. Because in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve broke God's law and broke his heart, they lost his presence. They knew he was not with them. And we humans, when we separate from God being with us, we're always afraid. But the answer to getting his withness back with us is not a work of our hands. See, Moses gave us the, the work of our hands, but Joshua gave us the work of God. Jesus is the greatest Joshua who comes to earth, and he shows us that our way into the promised land is not by us, by the work of our hands, fulfilling the law of God. It's by God coming down in him himself with the work of his hands on the cross, dying for us, living the life we should have lived, and dying the death we should have died. And the law can show you that your face is messed up, but all it can do is lead you to that sink that's going to clean you up. And the law of God and even all the success in the world can, can show you some things, but at the end of the day, it's going to take Jesus to clean you up. And if you're here today and Jesus has never cleaned you up, today's your day. If you're watching online right now in the Middle East and Jesus has never cleaned you up, today is your day. I, I do want you to be a success, but at the end of the day, I want you to be the person that put the ladder on the right wall because Jesus would one day say, what does it gain a man? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? If you get to the top of the ladder and you find out you did it without God all along and and you lose your soul. And today I want you to, to be successful, but I want you to be successful with the one who makes it sweet.